Jane Lowe on site at the Boko Hotel here in Orchard, which is the heart of the shopping district in Singapore. And with me, I'm very pleased and very privileged to have Bill Nelson, who is the chairman of Global Resilience Federation and also the director of OTISAC, which stands for, of course, Operational Technology Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And he will be sharing with us uh, his highlights of his uh, presentation, keynote presentation, as well as the latest in OT ISAC and hopefully also some latest uh, updates from Global Resilience Federation. So thank you, Bill, for joining us today. Thank you, Jane. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I know. You know, when we last talked, Bill, that was um, two years ago, I believe, at the inaugural OT ISAC Summit. And that was obviously held virtually because that was at the height of the pandemic. That's right. Yes. That's right. And we talked about, you know, how great it will be to have a physical conference to meet face to face yes. and exchange ideas and share information. And here, two years later, yeah, here, how fantastic. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So, Bill, you know, for our audience who didn't have the chance to catch our podcast uh, or, or rather our conversation about ISAC, OT ISAC, can you briefly give us an overview of ISAC and OT ISAC and also perhaps some bits about FS ISAC, which is one of the first, if not the first ISAC in the world? Yes, that was uh, 1999. The uh, Financial Services uh, ISAC, or Information Sharing Analysis Center, was created. And it was interesting. It started out, uh, there was a lot of interest. Some of the larger banks in the U.S. joined. And uh, it kind of was dormant. It didn't really grow for a number of years. I got hired in 2006. Uh, my background had been in banking and also payment systems for 20-some years. And I was very familiar with working for a nonprofit and kind of building the business up. So they wanted me to grow the organization. And one of the th things we try to do is provide, make sure we're providing value to the members. And the members are individual banks or brokerages or payments organizations. And uh, went at it and you know, it took a few years, but it started to grow. I think it, a lot of the growth had to do with the number of attacks we started to see. Mm -hmm. So a huge growth in attacks in, in banking, like account takeover attacks. Uh, also, we saw business email compromises, uh, distributed denial of service attacks, which were pretty bad, and uh, it got worse over, over time. And finally, the banking regulators really got behind us and really encouraged banks to join. So we grew from, uh, when I started, under a few hundred members, mm -hmm. all located in the U.S. By the time I left, we were in over 50 countries Right. with 5,100 members, uh, companies all over the world. Uh, you, you, you headed the organization for 12 years. Yes, at FSISAC, yes. And in uh, about the 2005, well, actually, that was uh, 2006 I joined FSISAC. In 2000, um, let's see, six, uh, well, I, I joined FSISAC in, in 2006. I was there 12 years, and during that time, we started to see a lot of other, it wasn't just financial institutions being attacked, retailers were being attacked, uh, energy companies were being attacked, and we were being asked to help them too. The organizations themselves were asked to join FSI SAC. I said, well, you're not a bank, mm -hmm. you're not an insurance company, sorry, no. Right. Uh, but I did persuade our board at FSI SAC to allow them in, and we formed a sector services division mm -hmm. within FSI SAC to support them using the same model we had at FSISAC, and we shared information uh, mm -hmm. on a cross-sector basis. Yeah. That turned out to be pretty good, but uh, also saw that it made more sense to maybe separate that as a separate legal entity. Mm -hmm. So we called that the Global Resilience Federation, and we started out with you know, three or four different uh, communities that we supported. We're up to 17 today. Right. And the one that wow. we created here in Singapore was OTISAC, and that was in October 2019, mm -hmm. uh, Operational Technology ISAC, really looking at the 10 or 11 sectors that um, uh, really are affected by operational technology. And that mm -hmm. can be healthcare, medical equipment, mm -hmm. could be manufacturing, um, it could be uh, things like uh, power, you know, power companies, mm -hmm. utilities. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are all companies that are affected by IT attacks that can affect OT. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So OT ISAT was launched in 2000 and correct me if I'm 
wrong, uh, was announced uh, in 2019 to be launched uh, at the Singapore International Cyber Week right. back then, right? Yes. And then the first uh, inaugural summit was uh -huh. uh, in 2020. And last year, you published your newsletter, the 2021 o OTI site newsletter. Mm -hmm. And you talked about, I think, not uh, the newsletter, there was quite a focus on ransomware. Of course, it's not a surprise given, you know, colonial pipelines, and, oh, yeah. right? Um, but your presentation, your keynote presentation is, if I may get the, um, if I want to get the title right, cor correctly, it's um, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, critical infrastructure impact and response in Asia. So that's your keynote keynote presentation. So, right. So if we look at, um, you know, how the Russian-Ukraine conflict uh, is um, uh, exposing some of these uh, cyber attacks, some of the ones that we hear about, uh, wipe aware, disinformation campaigns, uh, whereas last year when uh, you released your newsletter, uh, the, a lot of the impacts in the critical infrastructure sector was about uh, ransomware. So are we saying that, you know, we are seeing kind of like a sh change in motivations um, in, in the overall OT sort of uh, threat landscape from a um, ransomware monetization sort of motivation to something that's uh, about more about disruption and chaos? Yeah, I think it, was, it depends on the threat actor and the threat actors we've seen with ransomware, are cyber criminals, mostly. Um, the nation state, in this case, Russia, has a different motivation. They've gone to a kinetic war against Ukraine. They've launched massive cyber attacks mm -hmm. against Ukraine as a result. And they've done it before mm -hmm. you know, when they invaded Crimea and, and other instances. And uh, these destructive malware attacks are, they're not asking for ransoms. They right. just want to destroy That's or right. disrupt. And uh, for, in many respects, fortunately, the Ukrainian uh, cyber defenses are pretty good. Mm -hmm and they've able, been able to defend themselves against some pretty sophisticated attacks, uh, attacks that use multiple types of payloads to go after IT and OT at the same time, uh, particularly in the energy sector, manufacturing, and even banking. And uh, those attacks have been thwarted, mm -hmm. to, for the most part, by many of the power companies in Ukraine. The problem is, We've seen this before in 2017 when you had not Petya. That's right. I was going to uh, ask you that. That was had unintended consequences. That's right. That? Yeah. And that was uh, again targeting uh, a tax accounting system in Ukraine, but uh, they were also collecting taxes from other entities outside of the Ukraine. So it spread all over the world. That's right. Cost the estimates are cost as much as 10 billion dollars. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think about some of the disruption it had on shipping lines like Maersk, right. uh, others. Uh, it was very severe, mm -hmm. and uh, they lost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. as, re as a result. So, uh, so this seamless. Uh, it's it's not like you, know, you have a targeted attack and you're attacking one country. That doesn't mean it's going to stay there. That's, and that's right, not yeah. the first time that's happened. It's spread in other mm -hmm. nation state attacks and mm -hmm. other types of attacks too. So in, in uh, so compared to not back in 2017, the latest uh, Russian Ukraine conflict uh, cyber uh, incidents, would you say that are, um, how would you compare the impacts uh, globally? Because it seems like within Asia, we don't seem to hear so much about the um, sort of um, widespread impact that uh, not Petya caused. Yeah, it hasn't really spread like NotPetya, but there are being targeted. There's a lot of scanning going on, mm -hmm. and that can lead to attacks eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, there's a, there was a, a recent, some recent attacks against Japan uh, right. that we've seen, okay. uh, and they were motivated by the fact that Japan has uh, really stood by the sanctions against Russia. Uh, that's at least the theory. Uh, not going to comment if that's necessarily true or not, but uh, uh, it's certainly uh, one of the issues that we've, we've seen is, uh, uh, and we know in the U.S. That we've, we've seen a number of attacks directed at energy companies uh, that have been verified, at least five mm -hmm. different energy companies, and uh, financial services and others have been uh, targeted mm -hmm. also. So. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Now, if, uh, aside from this uh, Russian-Ukraine uh, cyber incident, right, um, within the OT sort of uh, uh, community. We hear um, in the last two years a lot of um, 
uh, focus. Of course, we also talked about this in the last uh, conversation we had two years mm. ago. A lot of focus on third party risk, right? Yeah. And then oh, in the intervening two years, there's also a lot of uh, uh, focus on zero trust, right? Mm -hmm. And also on the communication and uh, skills gap between the engineers, the OT engineers, yeah. and mm. also the cybersecurity professionals. So how have these uh, conversations progressed over the last two years since OTI site was launched? Well, I think the, the you have know, different mindsets. Uh, I think the mindset of somebody in IT uh, is not the same as somebody in OT. I think OT uh, an engineer is really concerned about safety and make sure uh, and reliability. Mm -hmm. um, with IT, you're more concerned uh, potentially about um, you know, confidentiality, availability, and other issues. Yeah. So getting them to talk the same language, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the uh, things that we haven't completely accomplished yet, but we're on the way to accomplish mm -hmm. more communication between OT and IT. And uh, at this conference today, I, was, I sat on several sessions where that was a hot topic. And mm -hmm. I looked at the audience, and we have a, a number of engineers here, a lot of oh, IT, IT folks. Yeah. So they're all here together hearing the same message mm -hmm. and they go back to their shops and hopefully mm -hmm. are conveying that and we're hearing mm -hmm. that that's what's happening because of the OTI SAC so it's quite a progress yes and third party risk still as important and as critical as it's gotten uh, yeah, it may, yeah the whole landscape's changed and I, I go back to OT and there's more stuff in the cloud now uh, of course. your your third parties have more th things in the cloud mm -hmm. um, you used to think, well, if I have layered defense and defense in depth, mm. uh, I can protect my enterprise. Mm -hmm. But I also have to now look at third parties. That's right. And they can be attacked. And I'm hearing cases, for instance, in manufacturing where an IT attack against one of your suppliers mm. has resulted in the supplier calling you up and saying, your manufacturer, and saying, hey, I can't provide product to you for two months. So all of a sudden you have to shut down your assembly line or, mm -hmm. or whatever it is you're manufacturing mm -hmm. because you can't get your supplies in. That's right. And uh, this is becoming a, a huge issue. Of course, we see it on other reasons. I think COVID has shut down some, uh, not, not, not related to cyber attacks right, or anything, right. but mm -hmm. uh, uh, supply chains, is, you know, it's become a huge issue, so. Right, okay. So um, given, you know, the, the backdrop of uh, the diversity of, um, uh, stakeholders and also asset owners in the mm. OT environment, right? And then, of course, we are seeing all this uh, rising in number of incidents of cyber incidents. How has that shaped the um, the information sharing landscape? So, are we saying that the partnerships and the um, uh, the stakeholders, the collaborations, are are we seeing more common language? You know, more sh common shared goals, more more trust. For example? Yeah, trust is, you know, I, I, I've, I've been around this stuff since 2005 or six, and I remember even in banking when we started uh, in the U.S., there, mm. you know, everybody says, well, the culture in the U.S. is different. They share. They weren't sharing at all in 2006. Right. And yes. I, I literally would throw a party if somebody shared something. Was that, that was quite such new a back then, wasn't rare it? event, yeah. Was like uh, but it started to change. And I think there were two financial institutions that decided to share everything. And when they started to do that, I the, just followed. The other banks said, geez, I, I, I benefited for this because I was able to stop an attack. Mm. And uh, they started sharing, and that became almost like a, uh, um, it steamrolled, and yep. more and more uh, decided to jump on the bandwagon and, and do it. Um, and I hear about you know cultural things uh, in Asia, and I, I've seen great progress being made mm. uh, with OTISAC. There's, there's more and more sharing. And the, and the really cool thing about it is, based on the platform we have, if you want to share and you don't want anybody know, know, to know it came from you, you can do it anonymously. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows it came from you. That, that's one way you could do it. Was it something that you had in FSISAC as well? Well, we put it in FSISAC too. And, okay. But people, when they build the trust, uh, you may have in-person meetings, you may have calls, and you start to trust the people, and then you may start sharing within a group, and yes. a larger group, and then uh, with attribution, if, if you want. And we have a thing called the traffic light protocol. That's right, and yeah. Mm -hmm. That establishes, geez, I, 
I'm, I'm willing to share this mm -hmm. at uh, a certain level. And mm -hmm. the tra traffic light, you picture you know, red, you know, amber, and green. Mm -hmm. And we have a thing called white, and that's, we'll share that's it right. with the press. That's right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but that's yeah. determined by whoever is sharing yeah. who, uh, how far it goes. So if I, I could say, well, geez, I'll share this information. The information is um, green. So you, share, you can share it with your, your partners, your customers, maybe just don't share it with the press. Mm -hmm. uh, and people abide by that. Uh, and, but the source of information, I'm telling you, don't tell anybody it came from me in my company. <laughs> okay, that's red. Okay? Right, okay. So that's once a lot of people use it that way. Or they just share anonymously. Another thing is I think there's more of an oblig. There's almost like a, I wouldn't say obligation. There's, there's nobody requiring you to share. It's more responsibility. It's more, it becomes more responsibility. And we've even seen law, uh, legal opinions saying, uh, hey, if you know about this attack, mm. that it could be affecting other, your peers, Right. You, al you almost have an obligation to share. Right, right. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. that type of corporate responsibility, mm -hmm. I think, is coming through loud and clear. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a good one um, where um, it, it, I, I'm just trying to think of analogy. It's, um, it's probably a bad analogy, but I'm just thinking about, you know, if a lawyer sitting in front of his, uh, his or her client knows of a potential sort of uh, incident that has about to happen, but not necessarily happen, but it doesn't breach the confidentiality. The, the yeah, law, you have to, client, well, uh, well, I, well, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know if that, that applies here. You have here. To obligation but, to, um, to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We've had, you know, we all, you know, we're connected with the members, of course, and they're sharing, but we also have private uh, threat intelligence companies that we have arrangements with mm -hmm. uh, that are giving us information. And I, I know of several examples where We've gotten uh, calls from a threat and tell company and saying, "Hey, we are aware of a pending an attack mm -hmm. against this X Y Z company, or maybe it's a whole." Uh, there's one case I remember that was like 34 different organizations were about to be attacked, mm, wow. and they had email addresses for them. They had right. their Facebook, LinkedIn accounts, everything. We knew exactly who was going to be targeted, and we were able to reach all of those companies, mm. uh, and uh, many of them were actually members. Uh, some were not. We contacted them too, and we said, "Hey, you're about to be attacked. <laughs> Here's the information." And they all ended up joining, by the way, after that. Oh, that's good. Uh, so they, we saw the benefit. They saw the benefit of it. And um, but you know that type of sharing is important. Um, there's also the public-private partnership sharing with government. Of um, and do you want the government to know that you've been attacked? Well, maybe we can share anonymously mm -hmm. with the data, and uh, we don't want to violate any trust that that our members have mm -hmm. so that's why if they make it let's say tlp amber mm -hmm. we we will not share it with anybody else yeah. except the members mm -hmm. okay so we can keep it within a small community yeah. if it's a green we could share it with you know uh, others uh, outside yeah. the membership but okay so talking about the traffic light protocol the white red and mm -hmm. sorry the white green and the red well and it's white. it's uh, red Amber, Amber green, green, and then we have this other thing called white. white. But that white's maybe something we've read about in the paper, <laughs> and oh, right, we okay. publish. <laughs> we just publish it, <laughs> right? Right. Because it's, share, it's yeah. valuable okay. open source uh, information. Social, yeah. Social so. media type, type of yeah. Okay. So talk, talking about the traffic light protocol, um, is there any sort of success stories that you can share with us that is white? <laughs> well, the, the one I uh, I started to share was actually um, thirty four. Companies uh, and it ended mm. up. Uh, I think 27 of them were already members, and uh, it was not the OTI SAC. It was a different ISAC. Okay. But uh, uh, you know, we shared it, and it was actually the first that happened on a Friday night. Oh uh, right! Did I tell you the story yeah, before? Smart. No. Oh, okay. Uh, it happened on tell a Friday. Us. Friday night, I was driving home from work, and I got this call from uh, a banker who told me about the threat intelligence he was receiving. And so I, uh, it was actually affecting law firms. And mm -hmm. we were having, having the first meeting of this law firm group on Tuesday. And we contacted all the law firms over the weekend and oh, Monday. Wow. And uh, they showed up on Tuesday for the first meeting of the group. And they said, I, th I think we get it now. <laughs> so this is, uh, we, right. we, we see the benefit. And of course, they, uh, th they were all joining anyway, so, but it was the first meeting. So the value was proven right away. And that group, um, that's up to 150 law firms now. Um, 
We don't have any Singapore law firms in it. We'd like to. It's they, all American law it's firms. It's American, Canadian, Australian, and uh, UK. Right. So uh, I think, uh, and, and we haven't really publicized it. Uh, so uh, we should maybe consider moving into that right. here in Singapore. So. The, the incident that you just mentioned, is what you, you get this call on the Friday evening. Yeah. So was that an incident that was uh, publicized in the media? No. No, it's not. No, okay. So it's not something that you can tell us? No. Okay, no, we, right. that's, that's, okay. That's, that's why we build the trust. We, we don't rush out and, and, and call up Jane and <laughs> say, uh, hey, we got some, a good, scoopy, uh, good scoop for you. Uh, real juicy. Uh, no, we don't do that. Um, um, yeah, this is. Could that be more effective? No, no, no. I think it would really <laughs> no, squash kidding. information sharing. But we are willing to work with the press to build awareness about new threats, mm. and I think that's why I wanted to talk to you today. So I'm very concerned about wiperware. Okay, and, tell us. Well, I think you know there were four different, so far at least four different wiperware variants that were launched against Ukraine okay. by Russia. This is the most we've ever seen. Uh, and some of them are combined with, uh, to wipe out IT and OT. Yeah. Uh, so that's of great concern. Um, and I think as we go forward, and this isn't the first time these types of attacks have occurred, nation state attacks that were destructive. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Saudi Aramco was the first one a number of years ago and it wiped out thousands of uh, devices had to be completely tossed and well they uh, have to buy new yeah buy new ones yeah, yeah it was terrible and then uh we've seen uh you know sony pictures uh, yeah, um that's right, that yeah. was a big wake-up call for everyone that was a ddos wasn't it no that no. was a, a destructive malware they mm -hmm. could not produce financials for six months mm. they had no idea who, who they owed money to or owed money to them um it stopped production. So you could say it had an OT effect because it did stop, stop production on some mm -hmm. uh, pictures that were being mm -hmm. uh, produced. Um, and that, w that was a big, that, to me, that was a big turning point. Sands Hotel made a negative comment about, uh, the, the CEO made a negative comment and they were, they were wiped. Um, so this, this keeps happening. And then you see the OT attacks happening almost routinely. Uh, you know, there's, in the Middle East, Mm -hmm. uh, between Israel and Iran, there's some, you know, yeah. water treatment plant That's gets right. attacked. Yeah. Uh, then next thing you know, there's some other uh, attacks in, in the Iran. The most recent one was a, uh, uh, I think it was a steel mill mm -hmm. uh, in Iran was all of a sudden mm -hmm. caught fire mm -hmm. <laughs> from a cyber attack. And, and some uh, hacktivist group claimed responsibility for it, but, you know, Patriotic hackers for some country yeah. that in the Middle East, you know, probably. No, mm -hmm. whether that was attached to the nation, who, who yeah. knows, you know. But uh, attribution sometimes is difficult. But I mean, this is becoming more and more common. So it could be, uh, we we could see this escalate. And uh, countries that have supported the sanctions uh, could be targets. So that's mm. a, that's a concern. You mentioned earlier, I think, um, uh, countries in Asia that have also seen um, the. Um, um, collateral um, impacts of this uh, wiperware that's yeah. been going around in this uh, Russian-Ukraine conflict. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I think uh, some of that. Um, you know, we, we're seeing um, mo we're seeing more scanning rather than the actual wiperware hitting, but that's usually a prerequisite. The wiperware has been very effective in that uh, it can. Um, there's a lot of research and um, uh, scanning done before the attack mm -hmm. occurs. So they know exactly what type of hardware you have. Uh, they they uh, really know your systems, OT and IT, intimately before the attack occurs. So that's a concern. And of course, you know, there's another country, the nation state, you know, South Korea gets attacked all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're uh, OT systems, uh, banking systems, others are right mm -hmm. under constant attack. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a concern. And I think the building that awareness and understanding uh, and having that culture that at least you make it a priority to do something about. I think the great thing about Singapore, you have the cybersecurity agency mm -hmm. and they've taken this seriously, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of mitigation uh, measures would you recommend to organizations who are, you know, con who, who, who are listening to this uh, and 
you know, want to take the steps to make sure that they are protected or defend themselves against well, it? Well, defense in depth uh, and understanding, uh, uh, you know, what, what you need to do in terms of identity, uh, prevention, uh, detection, and response. Backups. Uh, well, of course, yeah, backups. Mm. But uh, beyond that, um, uh, recovery Recovery is a big one now, and we're very concerned about that. We, we've been kicking around this idea, f f about started about two years ago, of building a, an operational resilience framework. Mm -hmm. And we made it, uh, you, know, you could call it a standard, we call it more of a rules document. Developed 37 different rules on what a company should do. And this is 100 different companies worked on this development, this document. And um, we're right now, we're at uh, version 0 0.95. Uh, we're not 1.0 yet. Um, so 1.0 is when it goes public. Yeah, we're going to go right, right. go out with it uh, oh, soon. Right, okay. But we went out for public comment. It was available on our on our website. Okay. Um, Global Resilience Federation website. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's we're still looking for comments. So we want to have it wrapped up by the end of September. Right. Okay. And uh, we're and still okay. meeting with a number of uh, different types of companies uh, for the rest of the month and we'll publish 1.0 now. That's 1.0. We anticipate it will continue to be update in the months and years ahead. Mm -hmm. But uh, it provides a really good roadmap for what you need to do to be truly resilient and uh, you know, um, developing uh, distributed immutable recovery. Mm -hmm. And we're not saying you have to be completely um, resilient immediately but uh, identify your critical operations, mm -hmm. okay, and your business, uh, critical business operations, and prioritize those, and is it okay to be up and running at uh, a 50% level? It's just, I think of a good analogy as like a bridge. Mm. Uh, do I have to, it's a, it's a six lane bridge. Mm. Can I have just one lane going each way, each direction? Right, yeah. Can I close the other mm. four mm. lanes mm. Or, mm. While, while the repairs are occurring yeah. and I'm recovering? So that's where we are with that. And I think I'm pretty excited about it. I think it's, uh, I think it's gonna make a huge difference. We've had regulator, regulator input. Of, we've talked to uh, different governments oh, right, okay. uh, and they're all, all very interested in it. And uh, of course we talked to the uh, different industries and, mm -hmm. and they're pretty excited. Um, this is not just for the OT. It's no, this is for, everything. For, and, and we for. think it, there can be more done for OT uh, with this, uh, so we'd like to uh, work with more on the OT side. It's it's, mm -hmm. it's not strictly IT; it's IT and OT. But there can be pieces of it that you could apply to mm -hmm. a particular industry that might be unique for that industry. So, okay. So, um, is there any sort of preview that you can give us on the top three things from the 0 0.95 version? Yeah, I think uh, there there might. I haven't. Uh, <laughs> Not the top of my head. That's a tough question, but uh, top three. It's always a good question. Uh, uh, press to ask. I, I, I think. Um, okay, top one. <laughs> top one. I, I, I'd say it's the immutable recovery, and then you have to define all your assets. Uh, make sure you're aware of everything that you have, and then prioritizing each. Okay. Yeah, and that's a that's a tough job. It is a tough job. And that that's uh, a lot. A lot of companies don't know all their assets. Uh, especially in critical infrastructure. That's right. And maybe you've gone through a merger or maybe you've had uh, equipment uh, that you've just uh, gotten rid of and got new stuff in. You haven't, uh, nobody, you haven't made the security team aware of it. So there's, there's uh, those issues. And then I think uh, in this concept of immutability and, just, and uh, almost having air gaps between um, you know, the cloud and uh, your OT systems to make sure they, uh, you can uh, segregate it and, and uh, make sure it's not affected by an atta IT attack. So this, that's three, there we go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, air gap is also one topic that uh, was, uh, is a phrase that, or, or a theme that was uh, mentioned quite a lot uh, last year in, within the Singapore sort of OT community as well. But I think, um, I, I think we don't really have the time to go into that uh, today, um, maybe another day about okay. air, air gap. But uh, one last question, if I may. Sure. Right. So um, looking ahead, you know, uh, I, I think that many of our audience would, uh, and probably yourself as well, would anticipate that the number of incidents is just continuing to rise, right? So the 
the volume and the data of um, you know threats information that's coming in is not going to uh, decrease. So the question is, you know, how is OTI side going to sift through all this, you know, information, right, to be able to continue to prioritize what is critical for its uh, partners and community? Well, that's a great question, and, and you're right about the increase. I, I think in OT attacks, I saw one vendor report that said it's increased 25-fold in the last two years. Mm. That's uh, 25 times more OT attacks than they've seen previously. You go back to 2011, there was one attack that they could document, and the next year there was zero. Or oh, maybe and people then, are just getting better at detecting. Well, they're getting better. At maybe that's a good point. Are they getting better at detecting? <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, they lost me. On, uh, they, it's lost my train of thought on that. So can you repeat the question again, real quick? Just the uh, yeah. So how is OTI going to you know sift through all this? Uh, well, no, I th volume well, I think yeah, well, there's there's volume and there's. Um, uh, there's automated ways to share, and I'd say at the lowest level, that's how we share, mm -hmm. and uh, using you know, a lot of times in sticks taxi format that's or right. other formats. Yes, we can share indicators like I attacking IP addresses, or, or you know, um, it could be the uh, subject line on an email attack. Mm -hmm. um, but then you get to the next level where you have analysts looking at it. Uh, it may require increased staffing mm -hmm. at OTISAC at some point. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. we have. You know, staff right now, but uh, as we expand the number of members, we may mm -hmm. need more. And then um, I get to the higher level. That's at the decision making level, and that is going. You know, th those are decisions that have to be made uh, at the highest level in the company about where to prioritize uh, their efforts. So I think uh, I think we're there. Uh, you can't stop everything. You can't patch no. every vulnerability. Right. You have to prioritize that. I think we can provide more tools and look at you know where the highest vulnerabilities are and what should be patched uh, and also what attacks to look out for and uh, share that information uh, a lot of that again can be automated so okay. right yeah. okay um, so thank you Bill for your time today Thanks, uh, Jane. I was gonna just ask you one I promise one last question <laughs> oh this is the second third time I had the last question okay go ahead right okay so we talked br very briefly about your newsletter for 2021 any sort of preview that you can give us for your news coming you know annual newsletter for 2022 you're talking about the OTI SAC yeah. one yeah that, it's the year in review yeah that that was a effort put forth by the staff here I think the uh, the growth that we've seen in the OTI mm -hmm. SAC is going to be mentioned but I think the growth in the number of attacks is going to be uh, documented. We've also produced a, a, a weekly ransomware report, uh, and uh, we'll have a uh, we have a, 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 a semi-annual uh, ransomware uh, report that we do. It's kind of at a high level, showing by industry where the attacks are occurring. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I think that's going to be also part of it. And then uh, other vulnerability reports that we'll be producing mm -hmm. that will be mm -hmm. part of that too. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. New, new stuff. Okay, look forward to that. Thank you, Bill. Thank, Thank you, you for Jane. Your time.